Well, welcome to our webinar. My name is Linda Kellum. I'm the organizer for the webinar series. I am very happy to um, announce our speaker today is Christopher Erdman, who is an author, developer, and experimenter in the areas of digital libraries, social networking, library UX, interactive technologies, bibliometrics, and data services in libraries. He is currently the Chief Strategist for Research Collaboration at the NCSU Libraries and has previously worked for organizations such as Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, the Europe European Southern Observatory, the Supreme Court of the United States, the United Nations, University of Washington, and CNET, and the Smithsonian. Um, and he holds an MLIS from the University of, of Washington's high school and a BA from the University of California, Davis. So, hi, hi everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Linda. I just joined at the uh, NC, NCSU Libraries as the Chief Strategist for Research Collaboration, formal, formerly uh, astronomy librarian. I started uh, my work at the uh, European Southern Observatory and um, just wanted to uh, thank one of the people I worked with there, um, Uta Grokoff, uh, who uh, really was a mentor to me. I think that it was important to mention uh, in this series, The Accidental Librarian, uh, that it's, it's helpful to have mentors uh, to help you along the way and learn uh, all the things you need to learn in the, in the domains that you cover. So I, I'm thankful to her. And um, I also wanted to encourage you to check out the European Southern Observatory just today. I was looking at all the videos that they have um, of of all the all the work that they're doing, and so they're they're based in in Germany and in in Munich, and their telescopes are in uh, mostly in the desert in Chile, uh, but they also have uh, some telescopes in the Canary Islands, and uh, a lot of telescopes are actually uh, located in um, in in uh, Chile. Uh, the second uh, place I was lucky to work at was the Center for Astrophysics, uh, as mentioned before, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And this is, uh, this is a picture, it looks like of a transformer, but it's uh, of the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is uh, hopefully uh, going to be uh, built very soon. Uh, um, it, these big projects in astronomy take very, very long, long time to develop, um, but this is one of the new observatories that's going to allow us to sort of peer farther uh, into uh, into the universe. So I also wanted to, to mention um, Alberto Accomazzi, who is actually the program manager for the uh, um, NASA Astrophysics Data Systems. And he's he's also been, in some ways, a, 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 a mentor, a spirit guide. I always uh, fell back on him for information on, on, uh, on all the things I needed to learn in, in astronomy, so I'm, I'm grateful to Alberto Accomazzi as well. Um, so I wanted to start off with, there was someone I, I used to work with as well at the Astrophysics uh, Data Systems uh, named Mike Kurtz, and uh, he's the senior astronomer that works for uh, the Astrophysics Data Systems, and he used to have this saying that let the literature be the filter for the data, um, and I always thought that was a great line because it it really, as I as I worked um, more and more in, in the domain, it it really uh, it really became like a mantra, um, and so uh, I, I I thought that was a great place to start for this uh, session is to show you the the NASA Astrophysics Data Systems, which is a uh, can be seen as a, a literature system, but it really does much more than that. It links to the data and astronomy, and uh, so it. I guess one way to describe it is you could call it the PubMed of astronomy, if you're familiar with PubMed. Uh, um, but it really is the database where all the astronomers really in the world go to do their uh, literature searches. And uh, so just to, I wanted to try to see if I could uh, um, do a, a, a live demo, actually, because uh, I think it's it's just more... Uh, rich. Uh, so if you try to search for NASA ADS um, in, in Google, you come upon this uh, search and you probably come upon this interface, uh, which is uh, <laughs> doesn't look so advanced, and, uh, but, but the thing is that it really is an advanced system. This is an old interface that they're moving on from. Uh, they're trying to uh, 
in, in, implement a new system that the astronomy community will use. But a lot of astronomers are very reluctant to use the, uh, the new system. Uh, but if you went back and, and went to Google and you looked down the page a little bit more, you'd come across the NASA ADS search, the beta interface. And this is the one I, I really want to, um, to show in, in this live demo. And here's the new system just to give you a, a, a first glimpse. One thing to mention is that uh, the ADS, uh, the Astrophysics Data Systems, operates under a NASA grant. And so they, they get about, uh, I believe, once I heard between one and two million dollars a year, but I could be wrong by that. But they do amazing things for the amount of money that they get uh, from from uh, from NASA. Uh, you know, a comparable system was Eric, uh, the educational system that that um, I know also receives a certain sum of money. I I can't remember exactly, but maybe it was along the lines of eight to ten million dollars a year. But I could be wrong on these numbers, but. I just wanted to emphasize that uh, with sort of a minimal amount of money that the astrophysics data systems is able to collect all this information from from the the the, uh, the literature and, and create this great tool for the astronomy community. So uh, just to just to um, just to start um, the, uh, the this first uh, glimpse of the the interface here. Uh, you can really do a lot. They made it very much like a Google-like interface, and so you can you can see they have some examples of, of uh, things you can do. So if you ha know of an author that you can search by, search by, here's an example, John John Hukra. You can search by the first author. Um, you can you can do all these sort of other uh, uh, targeted searches. Um, and I think the one that I really appreciate is the full text search here um, down at the bottom. So you can actually uh, search within many of the journals in astronomy into the actual text. And uh, I think this is a this is something I think a lot of domains still really wish for. Like one thing, one search where you could really search across everything and uh, um, do it at that level. And 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 it's been. One of the more powerful things that uh, I came across when I first uh, joined uh, astronomy uh, when I came from the Supreme Court, I, I couldn't believe that uh, there was this one source, really, that I could tap into to do all my work with. And, and uh, I really leveraged that, that particular aspect. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you more about the full text searching that I did in, in uh, using the NASA ADS. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight too is that they they have um, this this area here, the citations, references. There's really this rich graph of information that the NASA ADS takes advantage of, so they can link you to all the citations and references, so you can sort of traverse the literature, uh, discover all the related information to a particular paper that you're reading or or set of papers that you're reading. Um, and I, I'd like to highlight one thing that was extremely valuable was this review section. Um, so review papers tend to be very rich in information for early career researchers in astronomy. And uh, for those of you who get questions from astronomers, this, this is something I really uh, recommend. Uh, it, it allows you to, to do a search uh, you know, across all these, these, these articles um, and, and, and find some that can really help some of these early career researchers really get started and learn more about uh, the field uh, as, as a first step. And uh, the, I guess the other things I'll point out, too, there's, there's a lot of information here. You can go down below and you'll see this learn more about searching the ADS. They have a help page um, that really walks you through all the different things that you can do. Uh, so I, I encourage you to look at at that page. Um, and then they also have an API. So if you are a developer, you, you can tap into the API and do some uh, sort of uh, automated, uh, uh, you know, programmatic ways of, of searching the, the, uh, the corpus of information that they have available to them. Uh, so I wanted to do a, a, just a quick search just to jump you into the, the, the regular in interface here. So you can see already that, that 
uh, the, the full text search is working automatically so you can actually see these snippets of where uh, exoplanets is showing up in the system. Uh, and uh, just want to kick back to something in my presentation. I wanted to describe something that uh, is, is uh, that you might be seeing already. There, there is something called uh, a bib code in uh, astronomy. And so the ADS, uh, when it first started off, it started off um, in the early days, in the, I think in the, in the mid '90s or so, um, when the web was was young. <laughs> And uh, to, to create these sort of unique identifiers for the papers that they were receiving, they created this bibliographic code, these abbreviations. And um, they're just these unique identifiers for the papers that they were re receiving in their system. Uh, and, and some part of that bib code involves um, journal abbreviations. And so I wanted to first show you that there, there's, the, there's this, uh, uh, if you searched on Google for bibliographic code abbreviations in astronomy, you'd find uh, these lists of journals, these all, all the journals that you need to know in astronomy, all conferences. And it really is a great guide if you're starting off in the domain of understanding all those abbreviations. Uh, that was extremely difficult for me to, to get my head around initially. Like all the, all the things that, all the abbreviations that were out there I remember people saying, oh, you know, you can find it in M M M N R I S, and, and I remember scratching my head and saying, what, what is that? And uh, it means monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. So this tool was really a great, uh, um, helpful tool for, for understanding that. And just to move on to here, here is sort of the example bib code at the bottom of the page. You see that 1992, AppJ, that's the Af astrophysical astrophysical journal um, and it has sort of the volume and issue numbers of the journal and it has um, page number and the author um, the the, la the first letter of the last name of the, of the first author so you can see up above it has uh, this abbreviation uh, but just going back to the search you can see the bib code in action here they list it out and Oftentimes, uh, astronomers will sort of, sort of share those bib codes with each other as sort of you know short, unique ways of uh, of sharing uh, these papers. And you can it also gives you a quick glimpse into where, which journal is this coming from. So here, I know that this is new astronomy, this new A, but I can go back to that list of journals to figure out what. Uh, what does this abbreviation mean uh, to get a better understanding of, of, um, of you know, uh, uh, just of what's going on here? Um, and just, just to move down a little bit more here, I uh, just wanted to explore the interface a little bit more. Um, so uh, one thing that you can see on the, on the left side here is that you can, you can navigate between the authors and uh, you can... Um, you can see which collections things are coming from. I think some of the interesting, more interesting things are these, these keywords that, um, that are being pulled from the journals themselves. We, when I was at the Center for Astrophysics, we were looking at helping with this in, in, a, in, in, a, in a more unified way. And so we had a project called Unified Astronomy Thesaurus. And so that, that hopefully still, that project is still underway, and uh, and hopefully at some point that will help with navigating this interface a little more, a little bit more. Um, and and you can navigate the publications, so you can see uh, again more of these abbreviations. Uh, so again, you can look those up, and uh, you can see these bib groups. Um, these are bibliog bibliographic groups, and I'll, I'll I'll speak a little bit more about that later. Um, and then you have all these, uh, you know, like object searches you can do, um, and I, it's not opening up right now. But you can do these searches from other services to to uh, really uh, enter objects that you, you're you're looking at uh, and and navigate the system that way. So astronomical objects, vizier tables, or these are data tables uh, from from these publications that you can also search by. So you can search by optical and other particular aspects here. And then grants is another thing where you can uh, 
search through the grants that are referenced in these papers. So that can be very helpful for um, grant review uh, agencies and other things like that. Um, and then you have, finally, publication types at the bottom here. So it's really advanced uh, interface. You can also see that you can see the number of papers by year, the citations, the reads that these papers get, and, and sort of metrics that, that uh, are produced by the system. One other thing I want to um, note here is that um, in some cases you can actually uh, go to the article and see an image, a graphic, um, from, from that article itself, and so it gives you an idea. You can you sort of peer within the article before you even get there. And another great thing about the astrophysics data system is that it links the preprint, the, the freely available article, uh, with the publisher article, with other articles that might be free as well. Um, so you can see all the different links that you can, you can navigate to, um, and it has the abstract information, all the things that you're probably familiar with, um, and uh, some other things, metrics about the paper itself. So you can see how well that, that paper is doing and uh, the references associated with that paper. Um, a, a whole host of, like I mentioned before, the graph is pretty rich of all the data that the ADS links you to. Um, so uh, just to go back to, to my search, and uh, I wanted to note one more thing. Um, if uh, if any of you are familiar, it's something called ORCID. So uh, this is an author identifier, and it helps you disambiguate uh, authors. And like, so for instance, uh, um, author names like John Smith um, are very difficult to track. The ORCID project has really uh, taken off uh, more so lately of helping with this author disambiguation. And one of the things the ADS does is tap into that project and allow authors to claim their papers. And so one thing I can do is, uh, is, is start claiming some of these papers that belong to me. So uh, I can log in with my Google um, account, and I can start um, seeing the papers that, are so, that I've associated with, with um, ORCID. And so it's a nice feature, and I know that in certain countries like Italy, uh, or Portugal, they've started using this uh, a great deal now because they're required to, to do this. And so um, just wanted to share, share with you that nice uh, feature. Maybe some of your members of your community want to use that, or maybe it's a great example for how you want to integrate ORCID into uh, a system that you have locally. Um, so let me, uh, let me go back to my presentation. Let so uh, um, I, as I mentioned before, I worked for the European Southern Observatory and also worked for um, the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard. And at both of these locations, they have a number of facilities. Like the 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 uh, European Southern Observatory had um, uh, they had the very largest telescope, VLT. The um, they had uh, they were working on a project called the Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, which is like the Giant Magellan Telescope. It's one of the bigger observatories that's set to be launched soon. And uh, actually, the European Southern Observatory was working on the overwhelmingly large telescope. I'm not making this up, by the way. <laughs> so, they, they, these are some of the sites, but in, in, at some of these sites, they even have um, instruments uh, that are on these uh, on the telescopes and then on, on that astronomers are using. And I thought one thing to mention to everyone is this uh, AAS, the, uh, another acronym for you, the American Astronomical Society Facility Keywords. And it's this, just this great list of all the facilities uh, that are out there. I'm, I'm sure there's some missing, but at least it always felt to me like one of the more comprehensive lists um, out there. And I thank the American Astronomical Society for keeping it. So it's a great reference if you're looking at all the facilities out there in astronomy. Um, you, can, you can look at this and see 
what is what is out there and be overwhelmed because there are there are a great great number of them. Um, but just to just to back up uh, a little bit and 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 say when when I was at the European Southern Observatory, um, I I uh, I was sort of tasked with this um, this job to look through the literature. Uh, w one thing we were doing there before I, I landed was going through the the journals and sort of physically just flipping through and reading to see what where the mentions of the facilities were of the instruments. And I, I had a programming background, and I decided, you know what, we can do better way. We we can do this better. Uh, we can we can sift through the literature using the NASA astrophysics data systems to really track all these uh, um, all these mentions of of these facilities. And so here's you, what you're seeing here is a, is a is a screenshot of the of sort of the workflow of going through um, of sifting through the literature using the tools that um, we created. And uh, at the time, this is about ten. Ten years ago, maybe um, we we used PHP, MySQL, uh, sort of just off the sh the shelf uh, open pro uh, open tools to develop this system, and we tapped into the ADS, which was an open uh, open service to uh, help with sifting through all that literature. Um, so that this allowed you to sort of triage, pick out all these mentions. This, this system, which we call Telbib, um, and the and the full text, uh, I can't even remember what the acronym means, but Fuse, we called it Fuse, uh, but it was a full text search tool uh, that allowed you to to uh, you know uh, capture all these mentions, and so it was like an, a a librarian um, uh, curation dashboard, um, and uh, as you can see here, you. Walking through the system, you can see that your the library was able to sort of tag all these mentions in different ways, uh, often to the program IDs. And so program IDs ended up being the links to the data. And so on the next screen, I have a I have a screenshot of of, uh, of that. So the ESO Telescope Bibliography, the European Southern Observatory Telescope, Telescope Bibliography, allows you know has this sort of links to the paper links to the data through the program IDs. And um, the astronomers use this to go um, back and forth between the literature and the data. So at the end of the day, you would end up at this archive. And um, I'm not sure if any of you are pulling your hair out right now. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is where an astronomer would land and would have to sort of peer through all this to, to grab the particular data sets associated with a program ID, which was linked to a particular paper, to get the raw data um, uh, for that observation. One of the things is that, it, it, you know, I know in, in general that, that people often say that astronomy has got things work, worked out with linking to data, with, with the data and open data and all these kind of things. and. Uh, it, it, it's still, I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in sort of this interlinking of, of uh, literature and data sets. I wanted to mention here uh, that oftentimes astronomers use um, a file standard called uh, fl the FIT standard, Flexible in Image Transport System. And uh, this was really developed a long, a long time ago when the great observatories were uh, starting out to so like um, some of the, the names you, you 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 know of like Hubble and and uh, Spitzer these are some of the great observatories where some some of the, the NASA scientists really felt like they needed a way to share their data uh, and I think one way is this is where astronomy is lucky because I go to big data conferences and often hear scientists saying what standard are you using uh, and and trying to uh, work with the different standards that are out there and astronomy astronomy has been lucky that it has really one um, standard uh, the uh, if you were I, I, I shared a screenshot of, of sample FITS files I think the one thing the interesting thing to mention here for librarians is that FITS files have this header which is text 
and uh, in some ways it it re resembles maybe a mark data format of uh, of metadata so like that at the at the header of each of these files is metadata about the particular observation the the instrument that was used and all the, the calibration and other things that an astronomer might find useful um, but it, it's not perfect uh, these days but I wanted to to also tell you that uh, it's not just astronomers that are using FITS. Uh, uh, interesting enough, the Vatican Library, um, the Vatican uses FITS to preserve, help with preserving the material that, that's in their collections. And uh, I, I, I think the reason why for this, this, this connection exists is that um, there is a Vatican Observatory. And uh, I believe the monks at the Vatican Observatory were working with FITS and, and uh, probably worked with the library, the archives, uh, and telling them that the, the FIT standard, about the FIT standard and, the, and its benefits. But this is a sort of a recent announcement about how they're using um, FITS um, in, in the Vatican as well. Um, and just to, just to go back to FITS, um, the, a good place to maybe read about this, uh, if you're so inclined, is the Astronomy and Computing Journal. Um, I know when when I, I was leaving the Center for Astrophysics and, and joining NCSU libraries, uh, there was some debate in the community about whether FITS was the right um, standard. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was sort of a back and forth debate about this. And so some, some domains like radio, uh, radio astronomy don't necessarily uh, want to use FITS. And so there were... I remember an article called "Fits in the Crosshairs," uh, uh, and I was trying to find it before this this talk. But uh, there's some debate in the community now um, about this. But uh, I I think again going back to how uh, how lucky astronomy is <laughs> for having essentially one standard to work to work with. Um, and I I also wanted to highlight um, I. I I mentioned before that it, it's it's uh, you sort of got a glimpse of how you could traverse into the data from uh, the ADS, um, and I like this uh, Twitter. Um, I call it an epic Twitter rant uh, from Brian Keegan, who uh, I don't believe he's an astronomer actually, uh, and he was excited about the recent exoplanet uh, discoveries. And thought, okay, you know, is this, uh, are the people that did this doing things like other uh, projects in science, in science where they share uh, their work in a notebook? Um, these these project, these Jupyter notebooks that are becoming more popular for sharing code and data, um, and allowing people to sort of to play with what um, play play with the science that's going on. And so he was hoping for this, and he decided. He couldn't find a, 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 a notebook, and so he started traversing the system and, and, and just started ranting about all the things that were wrong of uh, trying to find this data. And I, I highly recommend uh, um, looking at this because it really gives you a glimpse of, of how, how, you know, how difficult it is still to, to tra traverse all these things and to um, work with the uh, astronomy data. Um, I, I also wanted to, to mention a project that I think does a really good job of connecting the dots here with the public, like sir, sir, in case of Brian Keegan, the universe projects which came out of astronomy um, as, as a way to sort of catalog all the images that they, they had. Uh, the universe project started with Chris Lintot, um, and now it's really blossomed into something else, uh, something bigger where you can use it for, for uh, doing, doing other projects in science. So uh, if you see on a page, there's something called Snow Spotter even. Um, and then the, the, uh, the other projects like Discover Wildlife. So Zooniverse Projects al allows the, the public or allows scientists to, to, grab their, to grab a set, to collect a set of data um, that they're hoping for more insights and to make it available to the public to do sort of this this additional work on um, and 
So I, I, I hope that the more of these projects um, are um, are coming online uh, these days. And I, I think in the case with uh, with Brian Keegan, Planet Hunter is another one where it could have helped maybe uh, making these connections. Uh, so uh, if any of you are thinking about citizen science projects and the Zooniverse projects is a great place to start. Uh, so I want to I want to go back to the ADS and go back to saying saying why I think at the end of the day why we were doing the the curation at the European Southern Observatory to to link facilities to papers. So in in this case uh, the facil the facilities the the uh, the um, institutions did it for benchmarking for bibliometrics, uh, but there was always this added side benefit of all that curation work helped the astronomy commu community with uh, the faceted searching that you see in the ADS. We provided all that data back to the ADS. And so uh, when you're using the ADS to search for the literature, all those data links are really there from all the curation activities that are happening behind the scenes. And, and so in this case, uh, thankfully, because of all this, I, I as an astronomer can do a multi-wavelength search. So I can search across uh, the Hubble Space Telescope images, so that's optical. Um, I can search across the Chandra X-ray Observatory, so as you see there, it's CXC in the search on the screen. And so I can search in the X-ray. Uh, and, and then I can also search with, with uh, with Spitzer, so in the infrared, so I can really do this broad search that I think would be impossible with all the, all this work without the ADS, and it really makes their lives dramatically <laughs> easier, I think. Uh, and I've, I've heard quotes from astronomers saying, without the ADS, I, I, uh, was, a, quoting the ADS is an important in t tool in astronomy is like quoting the air uh, that we breathe. And so they, they really, I, I think they acknowledge that, that the ADS means a lot to the work that they're doing. And I wanted to highlight again, too, like if you see to the right of the screen, uh, hopefully, as um, the search um, that, the sample search that I have of a multi-wavelength search. And you can see this um, database icon. I think it, it looks like the usual database icon above the title um, at, at the, the right corner. And it's, it's the link to um, the data. So if you clicked on that, it would bring you um, to the data sources, what I showed you before, to that European Southern Observatory screen where you see the links and the data connected and then to the data archive. And so um, this is a great example of, of all that work. Um, uh, tying everything together. And and just to give you an example, I, I think um, something you can look at later that helps you sort of understand uh, what I was describing there with multi-wavelength search, uh, the worldwide helps you to view all these things in, in different wavelengths, all these all this data, and uh, really allows you to explore, um, allows you to toggle between this, this, uh, the, the freely available data sets in astronomy um, in a, for, a sort of visual way. And so I highly recommend that as, a, as someone on the public science side, seeing, seeing things through, through uh, um, Worldwide Telescope really helps with understanding, with visualizing it. And uh, um, that's a freely available tool, uh, thanks to the American Astronomical Society. Again, uh, second time I've thanked them. But it really started out of uh, Microsoft, and uh, so now the, the AAS has taken it on. Um, so just to also uh, provide an overview from, you know, uh, one thing that uh, people, going back to that, that, that idea that people sometimes think that astronomy has got everything covered as far as big data, um, doing all these things uh, differently, and, and, and the way that we maybe want to do things. Uh, there, you can say that is the case uh, in, in some ways that the astronomy community is lucky. It has these major archives in astronomy that I listed, listed here. So 
the ESA Science Archive is one uh, that I mentioned earlier. MAST is the uh, Hubble, uh, the Space uh, Telescope Science Institute's archive. So this is the optical, um, mainly the optical, but it, it covers some other things that uh, so this is one of the major archives in astronomy. And uh, we also have HEATHARC, which is the High Energy Astrophysics uh, Science Archive Research Center. And so like data from the Chandra X-ray Observatory are going into HEATHARC um, as, as, as another place where archive, data is being archived for the future. And really these places have minimal budget sometimes to keep these archival systems going and so that's why Brian Keegan had all the trouble that he had uh, trying to trying to navigate these systems because really they're on shoestring budgets trying to maintain these massive archives uh, uh, and the other one too was the Ursa um, the infrared so that's also um, Spitzer um, as an example uh, but in general like then you go off into the long tail of astronomy data where Oftentimes you'll find data sitting on someone's uh, on servers or um, you know other other uh, other locations you don't want to think about uh, and you know oftentimes astronomy is still working with sort of tape drives being shipped back and forth from ground-based missions and you know that's that's uh, that's uh, uh, something that's still going on. Some big projects on the way here: the large synoptic. Synoptic Survey Telescope, so that's a survey that's going to be um, running of, of the sky, basically, and just taking these uh, um, scans of, of the sky, uh, you know, on a consistent basis uh, for years. So they're talking about the big data that, uh, uh, big, big data for astronomy is, is often tied to large synoptic, synoptic survey telescope. This is one of the things they're, they're trying to understand, how do we scale up? to, to uh, manage that kind of data. And then the other one is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and I like this image here. Like sometimes you can go see the, the JWST, as it's called, uh, on, on a roadshow. Uh, for instance, at South by, South by Southwest, you can see it in full scale of what it's going to look like. Um, but it's, it's really this, the transformer in space. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's going to sit uh, in one of these Lagrange points uh, and, and, um, and really, really, I think, help us. Uh, one of the things they say with, uh, with the JWC is help with um, exoplanet research. And so that's, uh, that's coming on, online soon, hopefully, too. And uh, um, one one thing that I, I also want to mention too is with the ADS, there's this uh, this uh, all that work that we we do to tie the literature and the data um, really helps astronomers with metrics and, and, and navigating uh, the resources resources. So here's sort of an example of how I I as an astronomer could find out all the um, you know on a particular uh, search a keyword search. I can find all the authors involved and and find all the papers that they're they're working on, um, and so that you know that's one thing that helps the community. But uh, like I said, one thing that that uh, we do, uh, the the librarians in astronomy is um, these telescope bibliographies allow us to to benchmark the observatories, um, and and this is just one example is from uh, a friend Jill Augerstrom at the. Uh, space. She used to be at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and she did this work to understand where all of all of the literature in our bibliographies was pointing to. And so, this really gives you a good example of uh, most of the astronomy literature, at least from our perspective, was sitting in relatively few uh, amount of journals. So uh, I can list this out: the abbreviations. It's the Astrophysics Journal the Astrophysical Journal Supplements, the Astronomical Journal, and those are all by the American Astronomical Society. So 51% of the literature in our telescope bibliographies pointed to those journals. And then there's the Astronomy and Astrophysics Journal, which is run by EDP Science, EDP, um, and that's about 25%. And the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society um, 
this is sitting at 16%, and, and then there's the other. So um, the long tail of all the other journals that we're tracking, um, but there's really this core, we always talk about this core set of journals that are really important to us. Um, and one of the things to mention here in the astronomy, these journals have um, really relatively low uh, uh, timeline to when they become open. Um, and so nowadays, I think it's even being pushed back for astronomy and astrophysics to, uh, to six months, even online immediately and open, open access. And so that's really fantastic. I think one, one of the great things about astronomy is that they're doing that. And besides the point, you can also go to a preprint server called the Archive, which allows you to see sort of the earlier version that the astronomers post um, so you can see almost the science in real time. Um, and it, it, here's just another uh, another graphic to show you. Uh, this is from the, my colleague Ann Jill, uh, Jill Lagerstrom, who really mapped, gives you a glimpse of, of the usage of the archives. So this is the MAST archive that I mentioned before at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And you can see that um, the uh, sort of current science, the not, not archival uh, data is, is, you know, keeping steady. And then you see this increase in usage of the archival data. So we often point to this as, as, a, as an example of how important archival data is to astronomy, too, like going back and, and, and doing the, you know, going back and, and looking at the data in different ways. And, but it's very difficult to do this because of money and the curation that is needed. So we know that as, as uh, librarians. Uh, another thing, too, I wanted to show you is a, as a, um, a paper I worked on with a group of people called How Astronomers Share Their Data. And um, we, we mined uh, the American Astronomical Society's journals to, to, for links to data. And I found that, disturbingly, a lot of these links were starting to um, break. And so you can see the percentage of, of this. And so it really emphasizes, again, that um, you know, we, we, we need to do more in, in, uh, in preserving and in, in archiving this data. Um, and, and I think a, a great example right now is this, the Data Refuge Project, if you've heard of this, around uh, the country to rescue data um, so that it's not lost. And I think the important thing to point out here is that this was already happening, that the data was already starting to be lost because people just linking the data and not thinking that it would disappear. And, and so that, I think this is important. Uh, another example of how we leverage the ADS in, in astronomy to understand how, how we're doing. And um, I think it's also a great point to, uh, to also talk about how important the ADS and, and that, that work that I mentioned before, how I thought about librarianship and I wanted to I wanted to point to a program that was sort of inspired by my work in astronomy um, called Data Scientist Training for Librarians. It was running at Harvard for about three, uh, three iterations, and then it moved to Copenhagen, and there have been about two of them. And you can see the videos of these training programs um, on the, the Data Scientist Training for Librarians site for um, DTU for Copenhagen. And, um, but really, all that curation, all that um, programmatic work that I was, uh, I was doing uh, inspired me to, to uh, launch this program with a, a bunch of other people. And uh, um, in, in general, it, it, I, re I reference it because uh, it was a gateway for me to also connecting with the astronomy community around um, culture and uh, programmatic things that they wanted to do. Um, I, I think just to start, the dot astronomy community is a great uh, resource for how sort of early career researchers are uh, learning how to code and learning how to do all these creative things, um, but also to create that culture, right, of changing the culture in astronomy. And 
Um, so there's other projects that I've listed, science writing for young astronomers, uh, which happens in Europe and is sponsored by EDP Science. And astrostatistics uh, at Penn State is something that uh, um, is run by Eric Feigelson um, as a great resource for the astronomy community to, to, to gear up and understand how to, to use code um, in their work um, to, to become more productive and efficient in the work that they, they do. Um, and Python and astronomy is another one, which is going to happen in May, I think. Uh, and uh, again, another option for astronomers to learn how to, to uh, program in Python. Uh, astroinformatics is something coming up um, in June. And it's the informatics community, you know, again, uh, linking all this information together so you can create a seamless um, environment or a seamless discovery environment for, for the astronomy community. And then there's ComSciCon, who, which was uh, actually started at Harvard, which again goes back to this culture of um, trying to cult change the culture in astronomy and uh, really addresses that uh, challenge of communicating science. Um, so I worked with some of the people in that community, and that the ComSciCon is really spread, and uh, um, uh, they had sort of a side spin-off project called Astrobytes, which um, allows it, it, it's uh, graduate students in astronomy uh, that create bite-sized nuggets of, of uh, papers so the public can possibly uh, read the, read them or um, so it's it's expanded to Ken bytes and um, there's uh, I think one of the things to cite here too is that I, I'm a fan I, I'm I'm a fan of um, the uh, Varfon Smith on Twitter, and uh, he 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 just took on um, a role as the uh, I think uh, head of data science at Space Telescope Science Institute, and he's always doing some really creative things with with what we're talking about here, and someone to follow on Twitter if you can. Um, but I know that we're likely to see some some pretty amazing things from from him in the near future and his group. On, on linking data and software and and the literature. And he used to work at GitHub, but he also has roots in the Zooniverse project. So he was working with Chris Lenton as well. Um, so I'm a big admirer, and I, I, I suggest that you look into Arfon's work as well. So these are some of the links that um, I gather from my presentation that, um, that might be helpful. But if uh, if we want, we can we can open this up to questions at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much. This is wonderful. I um, it's interesting. I'm a data librarian in the social sciences. It's interesting to see the overlaps in the conversations. Um, I think more more so now uh, because I think a lot of these things are are uh, of interest to all all communities. So. But I, I think one thing that I found is that it, we were so lucky in astronomy. Uh, because we had all these pl things in one, you know, we had all this sort of <laughs> literature in one s source, one place that we could tap in the a ADS. So I keep hoping for something like that to uh, to appear. You know, one thing I keep my eye on is something called Science Open, which uh, appears to be maybe something like that, but... Um, yeah, we're definitely not there yet, that's for sure. Yeah, so if you, anybody, thank you very much, Chris, for doing this. This is wonderful and definitely an area that I am not at all familiar with, so um, very helpful to, to be exposed to that. If anybody has any questions? Yeah, I, I also wanted to mention something uh, in the news uh, similar to this in a way is, is, is a project called Meta, and that was uh, this Chan Zuckerberg uh, big... Um, um, purchase and uh, it, it it you they're really after sort of the, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence of uh, trying to uh, make the literature more uh, help help with discovery and help it help with the literature being more accessible because everyone is in overload right now with all the the amount of literature that's out there and mm -hmm. so I, I would also recommend keeping an eye on that project meta yeah, I guess I guess the one thing to mention too on my slides uh, was uh, if you have questions about the NASA ADS, then Alberto Camazzi, who I I listed his Twitter handle, 
before is a great um, reference for understanding some of the things that you might need to know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing resource. I couldn't have done what I did in astronomy without him and uh, Uta Gropkoff at the European Southern Observatory. Okay. And so how big is your, the NC State um, astronomy program? Or do you all have an astronomy program? <laughs> I think you would. Well, it, see, that, it's, uh, this is an interesting presentation because my, uh, my, uh, my focus now is broader. And yeah. it's, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a, a step back in time for me because, um, you know, I, 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 there's a smaller group of astronomers here, um, not, not too big. And so more of my work is, is in other domains now. And mm. so taking what we, we did in astronomy and thinking about how we could do that here as well is something I think why they hired me. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> is that, uh, you know, some of these ideas could be applied in, in some of the other domains. Yeah. I think one of the, the issues that we run into is, so for the, the, the government, um, it, the government documents, government information librarians, one of the issues we run into is, and I've run into this is, um, in deselecting some of our, so I, we have still data sets on CDs and DVDs um, yeah. that in our collection that, at, especially at this point, I'm reluctant to let go um, <laughs> and trying to figure out how to, you know, match that to what is available online because there's been so many people who's gone off in their, you know, they've taken that data and gone off in their own directions with it, but is it the same? is what was issued by the government in 1995. It's hard to say, and so I don't know if, you, <laughs> if there are tips in the community for doing Oh, all the, all the time. I think data, data at risk, as you, mm-hmm. you, you can call it. Um, I think this is one of the big challenges in our community. You know, like there's, uh, besides Born Digital, what I mentioned there, of all the links uh-huh. and data that was on, on websites going, then, you know, that, the uh, the other side of it is as all the stuff we have sitting on our shelves and 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 uh, on you know locked away and um, I remember when I was at the Center for Astrophysics one of the astronomers got really interested in this and said you know I've got all this data and, and people should know this is a big problem that we need more money <laughs> to do this <laughs> and to cure you know to curate to preserve this information and uh, you know it it it's a hard thing to come by all that, um, you know, uh, 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 the, at least the funding to make make this happen. But I know there's there's some cases where people are able to get that money to make data available. And but it, you know, when when I, when we were doing this project on how astronomers share data, um, you know, I, I would frequently come across astronomers who said, you know, like. I've got all this data sitting in in, on the, in all these binders. You know, you can help me put it <laughs> into a more accessible format. Uh, and I, I just, you know, we didn't have the resources. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's so it's so difficult. And so um, I, I wonder, you know, like at least I guess in, the, in astronomy, we at least have with the major archives some data that's preserved, right? Uh, but uh, there's a whole lot of data that's just, um, and this is a funny story, actually, the very first time, my first or second week that I landed at the Center for Astrophysics, uh, someone asked me for Skylab data. Mm-hmm. And so I had to search around the center for anyone who might have squirreled away Skylab data on, <laughs> and so it, it, the chain went around for the longest time. Do, do you have some on the, you know, list? Are, are they stored on the on the server? And uh, eventually we couldn't find it. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that, there was someone who was just looking for it because they found it in a paper. Yeah. Um, and so that, I, I'm sure that's happening all over the place. Um, yeah. and I'm not sure there's much we can do about it except for the fact that, um, again, I pl- applaud these projects like D- Data Refuge, which... You know, one of the things, if you go to a data refuge event, they, you start off by basically first uh, identifying something to a, a, a source to the Internet Archive. And so at least you've got some mirrored copies of, of these things, uh, uh, you know, preserved links to some degree. Of, uh, but 
we're we're going to have to go back and curate all those links, you know, like the uh, our breaking and uh, hope that the Internet Archive was our savior and got, um, you know, got got some of these. Um, but um, I, I, I have a I have a feeling that Brewster Kale at the Internet Archive is very happy to see now that there's this interest in using the Internet Archive for for science uh, purposes. He he always I had a conversation with him once saying that he's always been interested in science. Yeah. You know, Internet Archive having connection to science, and so it, it's good to see that happening. It was, there was a, something in the chat about NSF. There was an update presentation, NSF saying that they want data to be preserved at the institutional level, not the department project website level. I think a comment to make about that is that um, the NSF sponsors, uh, you know, funds projects that, um, that uh, allow, you know, that, that these projects to set up archives um, in particular domains, but the sustainability part is the big challenge because they'll, they'll give that initial seed funding and you'll have something working for a while, but then they want to move on or, you know, like they, they want to fund other projects and so you're on the hook for uh, supporting, um, supporting this. So I think w one thing in astronomy, we uh, on my way out, the American Astronomical Society uh, was getting more involved with um, getting more interested in trying to help with this preserving data and, and helping with like setting up an archive for astronomy and, 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 uh, and helping with that sustainability. So they were working with people in Arizona, I believe with the iPlant initiative. So I don't know where they're at now, but that, that was I think maybe at the society's level, that that's a great another place where this can reside. Not just data, but we have docs um, that have, that go back to that era, and uh, without a program that makes sense, do you know do we keep them here at our level um, in our library? Just on that, I mean, never mind the agency aspect of it. But um, we're I've been digging through a whole lot of um, astronomy reports. <laughs> earmarking for weeding, unfortunately. Oh, no. Yeah, that's another thing, too. So we often hope that other institutions are taking care of this. Um, I remember when I was at Harvard, um, we had a Harvard-MIT meetup between science librarians, and the science librarians at MIT said that they had um, ditched some of their collections because we had listed things in, in the, the Harvard library catalog. Um, and. And we, we kind of looked at each other and said, uh, we hope we have it. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, because the, what the, what's represented in, uh, in the catalog is, is not, uh, it's, it's sometimes not, you know, uh, representative of what the, the true story is. And, and so, you know, I think you, you have to be careful with weeding uh, to some extent. Uh, you know, I think one of the things we were hoping for is to, there would be that communication, you know, you would also contact the libraries that you think have it and see what the situation is on the ground. Yeah, I mean, luckily with the, the, the doc system, we have to offer so for the most part, but um, it can be a little bit tricky, definitely. It's definitely painful, as Randall would say. <laughs> it is very painful. Uh, I think you, you definitely feel like a hoarder. All right. Well, guys, we are over time at this point. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for doing this. This is wonderful. And, uh,